Hi everybody, it's Andrea Ankrum with Indivisible Northern Kentucky District 4. Welcome to another edition of our Coffee Clatch Conversations with Candidates. This is where you get to meet your candidate and through a question and answer forum get to know their stance on issues that are affecting Kentuckians today. So if you're watching this live on our YouTube or Facebook channel, please feel free. We encourage you to send questions into us and we will get them to your candidate. So tonight's guest is Carl Owens. He's running for the House seat in District 69. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Why don't you take a few minutes here, talk to our audience, uh, tell a little bit about yourself and why you're running for office. Great. Well, thanks very much. Well, as Andrea said, my name is Carl Owens and good evening, everybody. Thank you for uh, being with us tonight. I am running for the House in the 69th District, primarily because I think I can do the job a lot better than its present occupant. Uh, Adam Koenig. Uh, why do I think that? I've had a lot of different experiences in my career that have really uh, prepared me for this job and I'd like to spend just a couple of minutes mentioning a few of those. Um, I grew up here in Kenton County. I graduated from Dixie Heights High School. And following that I attended Harvard College on scholarship, my wife says always to say. Uh, and then at the Harvard Divinity School for a while before finally graduating from Boston University Law School. So all of those experiences had a lot to do with preparing me for my career, which involved being a lawyer, a teacher, an advocate, and a public servant. I'd like to talk first of all uh, briefly about my law work. I went to work for legal aid after law school. Mm -hmm. I spent most of my career there working for the working poor, uh, advocating for policies and programs which would support them in their efforts to achieve economic stability and very low wage jobs. I also, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, worked most of that time in the legislature. And that, of course, is relevant to the job that I seek. But I, I did a lot of legislative advocacy over the years, working with re the legislators from both parties uh, to uh, pursue our objectives. Uh, early in my career at Legal Aid, I was uh, approached by University of Cincinnati Law School and invited to teach there. Mm -hmm. I wound up doing so. I, I was an adjunct professor of law and taught po poverty law for about 21 years. And then when I uh, finally retired from legal aid a couple of years ago, uh, I began teaching at Chase Law School at Northern Kentucky University and I continue to teach there. Finally, I uh, decided recognizing the importance of education for people trying to get out of poverty. I decided to seek a vacant seat on the Covington School Board. I was successful in getting an appointment to that seat and subsequently was elected four times by the people of Covington uh, to that position and served 16 years. During that time I chaired the board several times and I got quite immersed in the, the operating of a, of a public school system in a, in a diverse uh, inner city community with a lot of challenges. So these experiences that I have had, all of which have involved um, not only legal work but intellectual work, uh, but more important than that, the work of dealing with people, dealing with people with widely divergent ideas about what public policy should or should not be, and being pretty successful in bringing people together at times, reaching consensus around those difficult issues so we can make some forward progress. Um, these are, are the, um, uh, not only the experiences, but the qualities that I believe have prepared me uh, for this position and, and that's why I seek it and I hope the voters agree. Thanks a lot. That's great. Thank you so much. So we're going to jump right into our first issue and it's about the state employee pensions. Sure. Um, so what are your thoughts on um, how these should be funded and um, the future of the pension system in Kentucky? Do you agree with what the governor is proposing, which is at 401k, and they've, they've passed some of this legislation now? Um, if you don't agree with that, what do you propose? Well, no, I, I do not. Let's, let's begin by understanding that traditionally for teachers and actually for a lot of public employees, but uh, for all the obvious reasons, I think it's appropriate to focus on teachers right now. People could enter that profession where they would make less money than they would make if they were taking those credentials that they have, that they're required by law to have, into the private sector and, uh, and other areas. So that was, they did that for two reasons. Number one, because they were committed to public service and they were committed to um, uh, giving 
war uh, because of the nature of the work. But secondly, having a stable pension was a big part of that equation and always has been. So, and and uh, you can talk to virtually anybody in, in uh, public uh, employment, but especially teachers, and they will verify that that's the case. So taking down the, the, the defined benefit uh, pension plan is not an appropriate undertaking. Uh, the governor proposed that the legislature didn't do it for existing retirees, but mm -hmm. did do it for future hires. And many of us believe that that's a very dangerous precedent to set because it upsets that traditional equation, especially when uh, on the compensation side, we've been right. losing ground there as well. This is harder and harder for people to enter the teaching profession. We're not going to be as likely to get our best and brightest as we have been traditionally. Uh, especially, I think it's fair to say women have so many other options now. They can go into all of the other professions and mm -hmm. so many areas in, in industry, the private sector, that, that there isn't the sort of natural pull that there was historically of women into education. So I think it's a bad deal. Now, what is the right approach? I mean, by creating this uh, cash, uh, uh, whatever it's called, I'm sorry, I can't remember at the moment, but um, the 401k variation right. that they created for future hires, um, they did two things that were wrong. One, they gave a bad deal to those people. Mm -hmm. The other thing is we have to understand how the existing pension system is, is financed, like Social Security, mm -hmm. and like most things, it's financed not by having to have every dollar that you need in the future for vested people right. at hand today. Right. Uh, because what you have in the bank today is earning mm -hmm. interest and, and or, or whatever. I mean, it's being invested in right, earning. Right. And secondly, uh, you've got people not paying into the system, mm -hmm. or you normally have people paying into the system. But if you're taking them out and putting them in this 401k <laughs> variation, uh -huh. they no longer are paying in. So you're doing a double uh, whammy, if you will. You're you're disadvantaging the people who are stuck with the 401k variation, and you're you're destabilizing and weakening the system over here for existing retirees. Mm -hmm. It's a bad deal, and it's an unnecessary deal. Mm -hmm. uh, historically, teachers, along with other public employees, always paid their share. Right. They never didn't pay. Right. But the legislature did, and I'll get into uh, later. I'm sure some of the reasons why that was so, but. Um, they can fund a defined benefit plan for everybody without having to worry about this average dollar financing plan up front. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, they used that as a ploy to sell this this notion that we have to, uh, we, we can't afford the defined right. benefit plan, therefore we're going this 401k variation. I don't know all of the detail of West Virginia, but I would just say they tried this or a variation of it years ago. Uh -huh. It failed, and they came back. And I think in time that's what will happen in Kentucky, especially if we change the people down Right, there. right. It may happen sooner but, than But I think a necessity will force us to. Right. Okay. So uh, there was a Senate Bill 241 um, that proposed a constitutional amendment that would allow casino gambling and require 100% of proceeds to go to funding retirement systems. Would you approve of that type of funding, or what are some other new um, sources of revenue that um, we could use to help fund the, the pensions? Well, that's a two-part question. Let me answer the first part. Mm -hmm. I, I favor uh, casino gambling. I mean, I think... <laughs> only because better late than never. Right. Uh, you know, we're losing a lot of revenue mm -hmm. to surrounding states because of their, uh, and it's certainly true up here in our area mm -hmm. and, and uh, to Ohio and Indiana and around the state in a lot of border situations, but uh, we, should, we should legalize gambling and we should get the revenue that mm -hmm. it produces. Um, I'm not one who thinks that that's a panacea, that right. that's going to solve all of mm -hmm. the problems. The, the second uh, part of your question is really, let me say, what are the alternatives? I think gets you into the whole question of tax reform, mm -hmm. which we're going to get into sooner or mm -hmm. later, so we might as well get into right, it now. Right, right. Um, I, I worked, and let me back up and say one of the things that I've done in recent years, I, I worked the Women's Network, which mm -hmm. is a progressive women's political group in Kentucky, created something called the Commonwealth Institute for Policy Studies and Civic Engagement, mm -hmm. commonly called the Commonwealth Policy Institute. It's a it's a think tank. 
Mm -hmm. I, I was recruited to serve on the board of it. I did, and we had a, um, a one of our study groups initially was focused on tax reform. So we got into this in some detail. Uh, the truth is that our tax structure is very poor, and they just made it a lot worse mm -hmm. in uh, Senate, uh, House Bill 366, I think, the revenue bill. Mm -hmm. um, they um, <clears throat> Flattening the income tax is just simply wrong. It, the, the concept, it, first of all, the income tax is the most effective tax mm -hmm. because it does track income. It does track economic trends and economic, uh, the shifting of wealth and the right. shifting of economic cap capability. Uh, you know, historically the idea was that tax, income taxes should be graduated. Mm -hmm. The people who can afford to pay more should pay more. And I remind people all the time, I mean, I, I was alive in the 60s and, uh, you know, the, the highest tax bracket at that time was 90 percent. Right. But ironically, it's one of the healthiest economic times our country mm -hmm. has had. Mm -hmm. and, and people weren't uh, upset about right. that. That only came <laughs> later with Ronald Reagan. But, right. but um, so anyway, the point is this, that, that the income tax should not be flat. Mm -hmm. I mean, as the Institute for Taxation and Economic Policy, or ITEP, pointed out recently, the result of that is the um, uh, uh, people below twenty-one thousand uh, dollars are paying more. Mm -hmm. People above twenty-one thousand dollars are paying less, and people at the very top are paying a whole lot less. And that's just simply backwards. It's not fair. And secondly, and this is often not understood by people or appreciated. It's stupid economically. You know, Henry Ford, who was no liberal, was asked once, why do you pay your workers so well? And he said, so they can buy the cars right, they make. Right, exactly. You know, <laughs> I mean, you have to have a consuming class in order to, to, to have the products and services that people produce consumed so they can make profit. I mean, that's how the system works. And if we destabilize lower income people, mm -hmm. as we do, mm -hmm. with low wages and with high taxes, they're not able to consume. It really upsets the economic balance. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... So we should have a higher income tax. There's more, okay, but I, okay. <laughs> I know you've got a question. Um, so... Well, I'll come back to that. Okay. Um, so uh, House Bill 134 would give tax credits for private school tuition. Bad um, idea. This would take away public school tax money, and the state would lose revenue, 25 to $75 million. What are your ideas... Um, so we talked about kind of support funding of the public education system through possibly tax reform. What are your thoughts on charter schools and tax credit for private um, school tuition? Well, I'm totally opposed to both, and, and for the same reason. They take money away from public education, which is already pretty starved. Mm -hmm. Right. I think uh, recently the Kentucky Center for Economic Policy, not ITAP, but, mm -hmm. but a, a group that's, that's very, um, uh, it is progressive, but it's, uh, people understand they're very um, um, professional mm -hmm. and, and, and their work and very rigorous. Uh, determined that since 2008, despite all of the rhetoric about this budget that the Republicans have put out, uh, we have lost 16 percent of uh, uh, per pupil funding has gone down 16 percent mm -hmm. since 2008. So education has been losing, losing, losing. And back to your earlier point. Um, and so, I guess it's not allowed. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, and and these these programs like charter schools. I mean, I've seen it in Ohio. You know, people want to make money, or even if they don't want right. to make money, they're still siphoning money out mm -hmm. of the public school mm -hmm. system, which they desperately need for for uh, programs and schools that are not accountable, whether they're for profit or not. They're not accountable in right. the same way. Their their staff is not as accountable. So. Right. And the same with the tax credits, and it sounds like a good idea, but it's not. It just is another way of siphoning money out of the system and giving it to people who in all likelihood are better off to begin with. Right, right. So what would you do if you were elected? Would you try to re repeal the charter school? Yes, okay. I would. Okay. I would. I think it's a bad, bad public policy, and I would. Okay. okay. <clears throat> So higher education costs are skyrocketing. The average college student ends up tens of thousands of dollars in debt uh, upon graduating from college. Um, do you have any solutions for this crisis? How can the Kentucky government support our students in their pursuit of higher education? 
Well, <laughs> I hate, to be, our teachers, I hate right? to be a Johnny One Note band, <laughs> but it is about money, as, as almost everything is right. sooner or later. Um, you know, tuition, I mean, we, we've all seen these charts where the, the amount of money that the state provided to education was up here, mm -hmm. the amount that was provided through tuition payments by families was here, and then they right. kind of crossed somewhere, mm -hmm. and now they're moving in, in somewhere in that domain it's it's just a bad bad policy uh, I mean we have the keys program we have right. various grants mm -hmm. people can borrow money I think that, that that whole industry which is largely a matter of federal law mm -hmm. uh, needs to be reformed but that's not our, our particular uh, business tonight but I think the state simply has to provide more uh, of the support to higher education you know universities need to determine their priorities and mm -hmm. sometimes they have to make some pretty hard choices but, um, you know, they're being cut, too. I mean, right. when we see major universities in the state uh, cutting uh, lots of positions mm -hmm. and programs, uh, that's not a good thing. It's not a good thing for the, but for the students and their families. It's not good for the state mm -hmm. because what we're going to see is a brain drain, more <laughs> of a brain drain. Uh -huh. People are going to be leaving right. Kentucky and going elsewhere where they can uh, maybe get a better deal. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's been pointed out in other conversations that, you know, college may not be for everybody, right. and I agree with that completely, mm -hmm. but I think it's really a separate issue mm -hmm. than this. I think right. I think absolutely. We, we absolutely need to be, um, you know, making sure that we have apprenticeship programs and, and uh, vocational programs and all of that in place whether it's with unions or in community colleges, uh, uh, you know, co-ops, all of those kinds of opportunities for students who may, uh, I mean, there are good jobs in, mm -hmm. in those professions and vocations. And, and we need to make sure that we have all of those options available mm -hmm. to people so they can make the choices that are appropriate for them. Mm -hmm. But there, there, there simply needs to be more money invested in education, and that goes from early childhood to universities. Right, right. So the economy um, is booming, basically, and our empl employment, unemployment numbers are down in uh, northern Kentucky, in Kentucky in general. How do we ensure that we have enough skilled workers in this area to support our growing economy? So you talked a little bit about that, but what about the displaced workers or the older workers um, who have lost their job and now trying to reenter the, the workforce and these companies that are looking for skilled workers and we don't, we don't seem to have enough of them? You know, the interesting thing here, Andrea, is, is that you have a lot of dynamics that sort of um, cross each other and, uh, and, and sort of compete with each other. Um, for example, uh, absolutely, older workers should have opportunities to retrain. There's no question about that. Again, largely a lot of federal funding for that, not as much state funding, I don't think. Mm -hmm. uh, but and, and that's good and that's important that they have those opportunities. We have a, it's an interesting dynamic. We have this very low unemployment rate, and yet we, our poverty rate is still pretty significant. Right. Uh, poverty rate, my wife keeps reminding me, in Kenton County, the poverty rate for kids is essentially 25%. Mm. I mean, th that's, you know, I think that's criminal now. Uh -huh. I, I worked at Legal Aid in Cincinnati for right. a long time, and it was pushing 50% wow. uh, for kids in the city. And, and uh, you know, this is a hard reality for people to wrap around, um, this is as good a time as any for me to move into the discussion about wages. Mm -hmm. I mean, part of the problem is people can be employed. Mm -hmm. They can have a job, a legal job, make a legal wage, and right now the minimum wage is 60% of the poverty level. <laughs> now, the high water mark, and the minimum wage has been around for 80 years. The high mm -hmm. water mark was in 1968. And I think it was 98 or 99 percent of the poverty level. So it can yeah. be much higher. Right. But again, that's back to the 60s right. and that strong economy. Uh -huh. the, and, and things worked better. But um, so, so wages are low. And what happens is people are employed, but then they're very dependent on um, a variety of, of public benefits. Right. To, in order to make it. Right. Now, I'm sure you, you work at Children's. Mm -hmm. I know you see this yes, over there. Absolutely. Uh, but, but I can tell you, I mean, I've done the math on this a million times. So you make eight bucks an hour, you're making $16,000 a mm -hmm. year mm -hmm. for 2,000 hours, you know, 50, 40 hour weeks. <laughs> and so what else happens? So, well, you go out and you need child care assistance. Mm -hmm. If you've got a young kid or two, you can get Medicaid, you can get food assistance, you can get 
um, earned income tax credit, maybe uh, housing assistance, although there's nowhere near enough of it, utilities, et cetera. Here's what, here's what the outcome is. The employer's paying 40% of your compensation. Mm -hmm. The government's paying 60% of it. Now, I think that is weird and not you know, not reflective of anybody's notion of how the economy really <laughs> works or should work. I mean, you know, you get a job, your employer pays you for your work, and on you go. But it's just not what's happened here. Right. Corporate, you know, this is not, people call it welfare. Well, it's not individual welfare as much as it's corporate welfare because right. they can pay those wages and still get a workforce because people do this other stuff. But I can tell you as a legal aid lawyer, that that dollar you get in a public benefit is not the same as a discretionary dollar you earn. Right. It's hard to get. Mm -hmm. It's hard to keep. Mm -hmm. the, the bureaucratization is, is very difficult. It's not flexible, mm -hmm. and it's highly stigmatized. Yep. So it's not an effective replacement for earned income. So we have a lot of problems. We have a lot of people in poverty who mm -hmm. are working, which is, I think, sinful in and of itself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, if you work full time, you ought to be a, be above poverty. Right. Uh, poverty level, by the way, is artificially low, but mm. we don't even need to go there. Um, <laughs> th this is a very serious problem, and it goes back in part to, to, to what I said earlier. Our, our taxation policy should mm -hmm. take the adequate uh, recognition of, of what I'm describing here, but also uh, our wage policy. And, um, you know, wages should be higher, mm -hmm. and if they're not, we're going to have this weird economic situation where we have radical income inequality. Right. It's happening. I mean, people say we have a strong economy. Well, who's it strong for? It's strong right. for the people at the top. Right. It's strong for people who can own stocks mm -hmm. and, and so forth. And, and, you know, I don't know where the break point is, but, but it's not strong for a lot of people who are working very hard at jobs, doing exactly everything that everybody in the United States of America thinks they should do. Right. And they're not getting ahead. So how do we fix that? Well, I think several approaches. One is the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. It needs to be increased. And now, you know, what should the level be? That's really hard to say. We're at seven dollars and a quarter right. now. If you look at self-sufficiency studies, which have been done in most states, uh, that what does it really cost to live mm -hmm. for a family of two, three, four, two with a young child, two with a toddler, mm -hmm. you know, and, and all these different variations. What it comes out to is people need about 200 to 250 percent of the poverty level. So what that means is that they would have to be earning 20, 22 dollars. Mm -hmm. Well, we're not going to get a minimum wage of 22 dollars. Right. I'm, I'm a pragmatist. Right. I'm a realist. I know all of my work in the legislature supports the fact that you know you you move what you with what you can. Now there was a bill introduced that would have gone to 1010. Right. Well, is that adequate? No. Is it a start? Yes. And having been I mean, I <laughs> I checked back to see when the first op-ed I ever wrote on the minimum wage, and it was before 2000. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been on this issue a long, long time. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, the economists will argue, well, you know, does it kill jobs? Uh, Small businesses. Blah, 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 blah. But, but in the end, you have to raise it and you, and in order to circumnavigate that that little problem you're going to have to start modest mm -hmm. i believe so i would support that bill right uh as a starting point right. but it's nowhere near uh, right. an adequate right. ending point right okay great yeah um so uh kentucky has become a right to work state right which we know is anti-union um what are your thoughts on kentucky adopting this uh, right to work environment and if you're elected what would you do about this issue well, we try to repeal it. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's bad. I think uh, for several reasons, although my friends in the chamber, the, the chamber president and I are friends, mm -hmm. actually, and we've talked about this at some length. We just disagree about it. But uh, <clears throat> I think unions created the middle class in mm -hmm. this country. They, they have produced a wage, not just wage, but many protections and, and benefits for workers over the years. And the demise of unionization can be tracked. Uh, economically with the, the um, total stagnation of wages mm -hmm. for the last decades. Right. I mean, really, mm -hmm. decades, going back uh, to the Reagan era. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's a race to the bottom, <laughs> Qu to coin a phrase. Right. I mean, it puts us in there competing with other, other southern states where mm -hmm. 
you know, uh, people say, well, it's great for the economy. Well, it, it, again, it's great for maybe these people up here right. who benefit, but it's not great for the people down here who are losing, losing, losing wages. It's like cutting back or eliminating the prevailing wage. Right. It's just cutting rather than supplementing and raising what people are getting for working. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, this is the great irony. Everybody says work, 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 right. and we'll talk about Medicaid shortly. <laughs> And what they're doing with Medicaid. But, you know, the fact is work doesn't pay. Right. <laughs> and it has Seems to pay more. Now. And so I can assure you that if I'm elected, I will <laughs> I will be deeply, deeply invested in, in uh, trying to make unions more uh, have uh, a chance mm -hmm. to, to reassert themselves as a functioning part of the economy. And, and it works. My son's a lawyer for Kroger's. I mean... Kroger's has relationships with the unions that right. work very well, right. actually, and everybody benefits. Mm -hmm. It does not need to be this this sort of ideological warfare that right. it's turned out to be. Right. So I, I, the short answer is I would work to repeal it. I think it's bad public policy. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, when you destabilize the working class, if you will, our workers, you're only hurting yourselves because we can't have the that the economic participation that right. we need to hear from them right okay we have an online question so here it is i understand giving some tax breaks to businesses so they will will locate in kentucky but what do you think about the amount of tax breaks that seem so outrageously excessive for instance the arc in grant county well <laughs> i think that was a bad deal <laughs> uh, i think generally speaking and uh, had an interesting conversation with Governor Bashir wants about this because a part of our tax study that I referenced earlier with the Commonwealth Institute was to go into all of We do not collect more money than we collect <laughs> because of all of those tax breaks and abatements and exemptions mm -hmm. and so forth. Uh, they need to be re-examined. They need to be analyzed in terms of are they providing currently any public benefit and if they're not, they should be eliminated. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and I think there's just no question about that. And I'm sorry, what was the rest of the question? Not about the ARC, but the it first was, part. Um, what do you think about the amount of tax breaks that seem so outrageously excessive? Yeah. What, what people, what is true, there are many things that are true, but what is true uh, about this is that if you ask people why do people come to this area, mm -hmm. You know, it's not the tax abatements. It's it's the transportation system. Mm -hmm. It's the the um, <coughs> uh, markets. Mm -hmm. I mean, people say you can go uh, I don't know an hour from here in any direction and touch eighty percent of America or something like that. <laughs> it's probably not just an hour, but I, I, you know, I mean, it's centrally located. It's centrally located transportation resources. We've got a river. We have airports. Mm -hmm. We have interstates. We have railroads. Um, and people can get, uh, you know, they can they can get their their supplies and mater raw materials. They can get their products out, and you know, they need a labor force, mm -hmm. and that's that's sort of like they have a, a a pretty good labor force. But as you suggested earlier, there are things we're not producing in order to get those jobs filled. I don't know all the reasons for that, to be honest, but I think that part of it is cost. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, people aren't, we, we're not training many engineers. We're not training uh, a lot of people in very technical, skilled mm -hmm. areas. Mm -hmm. I did want to say something earlier. Can I go back yeah, and sure. touch on something uh -huh. about work? Okay. This is one of those competing considerations mm -hmm. that make this whole thing hard to understand and figure out. So, automation. Mm -hmm. um, more men drive something for their job than anything else. Mm -hmm. There are more men who drive. It, it could be a bus, it could be a truck, mm -hmm. it could be a limo, whatever it is. Uh, so we're, we're going to have driverless vehicles. Right. We are going to put millions and millions of men, primarily men, it's not just men, I'm not trying to be <laughs> gender uh, discriminatory here, but, I, but, but that it is more true of men. Um, and so we're, we're putting a lot of people out of we work. We better be prepared. We're, you know, <laughs> my daughter visited uh, in her graduate work program. She visited a, a, a plant in China. Mm -hmm. And this, this plant was like huge. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it was like football fields, multiple football fields. Oh, long. wow. And like 10 people were running it. 
Wow. At the, sitting at consoles, uh -huh. just doing all everything. The, all the robots. Doing everything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean... It's coming. You can, well, it's here, mm -hmm. it, but, it, but, but I think the impacts are not yet being fully right, felt. Right. And so and my son keeps saying to me, you know, <laughs> what are we going to do when we have a society with a lot of people who just don't have to work? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How are they going to live? Right. How, how are they going to live financially? What are they going to do? You know, what, what's the impact going to be on uh, addiction, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. mental health, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, just to say that it's a, it's a complex world, and I think we don't see our way through that right. at all. And we, it sounds like we need to be prepared or proactive. Absolutely. Um, instead of reactive, which is right. what we do a lot of. Right. So. Okay, so we're going to shift gears a little bit. Um, talk about the opi opioid crisis, yeah. right? That's a huge problem here. Um, and there's multiple factors that are involved. Big pharma, physicians overprescribing, the need for alternative pain medications. What are your thoughts and ideas for combating this epidemic here in Kentucky? Well, I'm not sure that there's anything particularly mysterious. I mean, we need lots of treatment. Uh, we need, um, <clears throat> you know, things, whatever, I mean, needle exchanges and things that, that help protect people. Uh, I think, but, but I think on the treatment side, we just need a lot of public investment mm -hmm. in that. It's the appropriate approach. Uh, I think we need to, I'm going to come in a moment to, to sort of step back from how to, how to deal with it mm -hmm. and try to look at some of the reasons right. we have such an extensive manifestation of this. But um, the, um, you know, I think medicinal marijuana mm -hmm. is, is a, something that we need to do. I think it's, it's uh, time has come. Right. I think there's white. Is it Sanjay Gupta? Is that the guy's yes. name? <laughs> yes. When he's, he's for it, show. I know. When he's for it, yep. then I think America's <laughs> for it. Right. <laughs> and so, yeah, I was just watching him yeah. today. So, <laughs> so you know, I think that's one approach. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it is about big pharma. It is about doctors and all that. But, uh, but it's also about other things. You know, it's about depression. Right. It's about a lot of uh, mental illness in this society because associated with all the anger. Mm -hmm. that's out there that, that people talk about so much, it's real. Mm -hmm. And there are real reasons for it. And again, I don't mean to, to be a, a one-note band, but I think the economic stagnation, people feel like, you know, I'm working harder, I'm not getting ahead, my kids aren't getting ahead. Mm -hmm. You know, debt is a strategy for, for uh, uh, you know, living, mm -hmm. and that's not right. a very effective one. Right. And it will engulf you in the end. And uh, And so people are... You know, they have some things to be depressed about, Right, right. I would say. But I think we have, you know, if we don't attend, I, I, I'm a believer, I'm, a, I'm an integrationist. I mean, I think that that when we do the right things policy-wise in society, then everybody benefits. Mm -hmm. I'm a great believer in that. That's also biblical, but <laughs> but the, putting that aside, I think it's true. I think it's true, you know, socially and psychologically that if, if we're treating people fairly um, in, in terms of employment, in terms of, of society, in terms of, you know, whether you're, what color are you, mm -hmm. how are you being treated by the police? I, I mean, it, it has so many different manifestations. But, you know, with all of this anger um, and self-medication, you know, and right. I'm not trying to let pharma and, mm -hmm. and the doctors off the hook at all. Right. You know, I think there are lots of guilty people here, but I do think that the self-medication that people do uh, because of despair or, mm -hmm. or because of relative despair needs to be uh, uh, looked at as a part of that. Mm -hmm. I, I think we have to look at it all holistically is what I'm trying to say. Okay. Yeah. So um, moving on to marijuana then, you do support medical marijuana. What about legal recreational marijuana? Well, I'm inclined to support that. I mean, I, personally, uh, that's my inclination. Mm -hmm. I do think we probably need to go a little slower there. And the reason is because I think the attitudes about marijuana on the recreational side still have more of a generational um, <clears throat> alignment or mm -hmm. whatever, misalignment, mm -hmm. than, than for medicinal. And I think, you know, some states are doing this. I think we need to, it, it would not be a bad thing to go a little slow mm -hmm. to take a, account of what states that have legalized are doing uh, and, and what the impacts are. What's the impact on crime? What's mm -hmm. the impact on uh, employment behavior? What's the impact on addiction, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera? The whole issue of gateway or not. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, let's... Let's look at some data. I know there's existing data. I'm not trying to, to slight that, but I, I think 
I, I, I'm inclined to do it, and I think we should start a process, like a, a, a task force or mm -hmm. you know work group, whatever, to to do what I'm describing mm -hmm. here, and then with an eye toward assuming we determine that you know it's what we think, right? Then yeah, let's go do it. Mm -hmm. But I think I think there's still, and, and this is my sort of negotiator's instinct mm -hmm. or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, how do you build consensus? I still think there's some a little more consensus to be built here, mm -hmm. and the facts are always good to look at. Right, right. Okay. So, talk about that. so House Bill 372 um, was an anti-marriage equality bill um, that basically would allow social service and housing discrimination against same-sex married couples. If you are elected, what would you do to ensure that Kentucky does not discriminate against anyone, regardless of race, religion, or sexual orientation? Everything in my power. I mean, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm totally a pro-human rights person. That's what you do. Person. That's <laughs> what I've, right. I mean, I've invested my life in, right, right. in uh, trying to treat people right, uh, equally, and justly. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's a bad bill. Didn't pass. That's good. But yeah. obviously there's somebody out there well, of who's course. introducing this. There are this. people out there who... So how I mean, do we protect our, our civil rights? But being vigilant, and by when those things come up, we slap them down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, we, we say no, you right. know, in, in every way that we can. Mm -hmm. I, one thing we need to understand here, i got to get this in somewhere, and that is ALEC. Uh -huh. I mean, there, uh, you know, we have to understand that this stuff isn't just happening in Kentucky, right. and it's not accidental or, you know, uh, you know, uh, just sort of uh, somebody's oh, whim mm -hmm. that, that that this stuff comes up. I mean, the Koch brothers, with their money and their influence and their creation in support of ALEC and these this whole grid of think tanks and university chairs and all of the stuff that they've got, people, everybody should read Dark Money, for starters. Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. but all of that is very, very real, but they are feeding state legislatures across the country all of these bad ideas. Mm -hmm. Especially, I mean, and, and since a lot of them are now in the hands of, of Republican majorities right. and Republican governors, we've got a very major advance going on in the country to try to push these things back. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think they will push back. Mm -hmm. I don't think that respect for, for same-sex mm -hmm. marriage and, and so forth will push back. And when people say to me, well, why should I have to make a cake for a gay couple? And I'm sitting there saying, well, you know, how do you think that woman felt behind the lunch counter back in the 1950s right. when, when she said, you know, I really don't want to serve that person. It's against my religion. Mm -hmm. You know, God didn't make them the same as us. Mm -hmm. You know, that was not her. If you hold yourself out to do business to the public, right. then you hold yourself out to do for business everyone. for the public, for right. everyone. Right. Absolutely. It wasn't her choice, and I don't think it's the cake maker's choice. Right. Okay. Um, there were many bills being presented or that were presented in the legislature. Um, that would, would try, they were trying to limit a woman's reproductive health rights. Um, sometimes we feel like we're under attack by the legislature. What's your stance on a woman's right to choose what's best you for her? Are. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to feel that way. We are. Right? Right. There's a reason you feel that way. <laughs> I know, way. yeah. Um, what's your stance on a woman's right to choose what's best for her reproductive health? Uh, here in northern Kentucky, uh, St. Elizabeth has taken over our health care system, and they will not perform some procedures, yeah. such as tubal ligation, due to their beliefs, right. their set of beliefs. How can you help um, women's right to choose? Well, let me begin with just being very straightforward about where I am. I, I, I read Roe v. Wade when it was published, um, or, or I guess the, the next year I mm -hmm. started law school, mm -hmm. the year after it came out. Um, I think the court correctly decided the issue. Mm -hmm. They had competing constitutional rights, liberty and life, and they basically balanced them and made what I think is the right decision. Now, that's a bit of a lawyer-like mm -hmm. start to answer the question, but I, I think it is right. I think that women, you know, people say to me, what do you think about abortion? I say, I'm never gonna have to decide that. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a man. <laughs> I'm never gonna have to decide that for myself. And I don't think I have any business trying to decide that for you. So, I'm pro-choice. Mm -hmm. uh, do I like abortion? No, actually, I don't. But, you know, <laughs> So I'm never going to have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, uh, so I, I am pro-choice. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whenever anybody asks me about abortion, I mean, 
the beginning of the conversation is the end of the conversation because if they're asking, I don't have the right answer and that and that's sort of that. I don't make light of other people's convictions at all. I respect people's convictions. I know many, many, many people, including many, many strong Democrats who are very strongly pro-life. Mm -hmm. And I respect that. I just think that, you know, we have to find a way in our politics to say, okay, we're adults, we can disagree about this, but then we can go work on these other 50 things that we agree on, more mm -hmm. or less, and, and that we should be able to do that. So uh, that's where I stand. I would oppose laws that continually try to chip away mm -hmm. at that right. With respect to St. E, Christ Hospital really wants to come over here mm -hmm. and is making a big effort to do it, and I fully support it. Sandy opposed it. I think they lost in the initial round. I'm not sure exactly where that is now. Mm -hmm. If they're um, uh, in, in, on certificate of need, I, I think that they're in uh, some stage of appealing that. Mm -hmm. But, but um, you know, because I mean, it's for for the both hospitals really. It's it's big economic right. consideration. But women in Northern Kentucky deserve to be able to get what they need here in Northern Kentucky, right. and not have to go somewhere else and get it. Right. Um, and um, Great. that's what I think about that. Great. Okay, um, there was a House Bill 227, which was basically anti-solar. It didn't pass, but somebody, um, you know, introduced this, and it would re it would have rewarded monopoly utility companies and punished consumers. Right. Um, it would have put rooftop solar out of reach for most Kentuckians. So we really need to keep up with the rest of the country in terms of clean, green energy. What would you do to help and promote, help protect and promote the use of clean energy? Well, uh, <laughs> I mentioned earlier the Commonwealth Institute. We did mm -hmm. a tax study. Um, we also did a study on renewable energy. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. And my part of, uh, the road part of it, had to do with looking at the legal standards that the Public Service Commission uses when they evaluate uh, fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. and, uh, this is sort of a, an indirect way of answering your question, but um, that standard never really looked at all of the costs for, for coal. Mm -hmm. I mean, they might look at the extraction costs and, and maybe the transportation costs. Never looked at the impact on health. Never, mm -hmm. These are externalities. Never looked at the impact on <laughs> roads. Mm -hmm. You know, coal trucks needed like double the, the, the depth of, of uh, asphalt, asphalt or concrete mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in order to withstand the, the beating that these trucks, none of that was ever mm -hmm. included. So but one part of this way of coming at this issue is Let's have an honest, and to say nothing of disease, right? And, and, and the impact on health and the environment. So, uh, you know, what we were pushing for was we want to move to renewables because you don't have those issues mm -hmm. with renewables, and, and and so that was our strong position, and mm -hmm. it is my strong position. Mm -hmm. Now, the bill was bad. It, it wanted to screw up net metering, mm -hmm. and basically a simple proposition: if you have solar on your rooftop. You're generating electricity if you, on a given day or week or however they measure that, I don't know all the details, you know, but if you were generating more than you needed, right. you were Some feeding it back in the system. And you were getting credit for right. that. Right. You know? And that was going off your bill. Whereas if you needed energy and it came in, then you're paying for that. Right. Well, that makes a lot of sense. And that also makes solar much more affordable. So it was a bad bill. I would have voted against mm -hmm. it. Again, we have to just be vigilant against stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But I think we also have to be proactive in the sense of, I mean, we've got these coal fields, uh, uh, not coal fields, but mountaintops that right. have been removed over there. You know, Adam Edlin and others are, are looking at, and doing things over there and developing uh, the ideas of solar fields mm -hmm. on those mountaintops where there's really not much else possible and not much else going on, mm -hmm. but they can actually do what we need, which right. is generate a lot of electricity, mm -hmm. A, B, employ a lot of people, right, right. many more jobs in solar than coal, right. and, and C, you know, everybody benefits. Yep. More money for schools. Right, exactly. More money for opioid treatment. Right, right. Okay, so we're going to talk about guns now. Should Kentucky have stricter gun ownership laws, and do you think that assault rifles should be banned? Yes and yes. Um, I'm going to say a lot more, but I, I'm of record of this. I've written about this. It's on my uh, website mm -hmm. and, and all over Facebook at one time. <clears throat> I think we should have universal background checks, mm -hmm. close the loophole, the gun show loophole. 
Uh, I think the assault rifles should be banned. They were for mm -hmm. a 10-year period. Mm -hmm. Look at the data. Facts <laughs> matter. <laughs> During that 10-year period, they were banned. The, the, the mass shootings went down. Mm -hmm. The ban was lifted because that was built into the legislation that passed. And once it was lifted, they shot back up. So. Mm -hmm. I think the data support uh, that it does matter. I mean, I have a lot of people tell me, well, you can't, uh, you know, won't have any impact. And I say, yeah, it, it does have an impact. Mm -hmm. It did have an impact. Is, is it perfect? No. But it's a step in the right, right. direction. It's one we can and should take. Okay. And I think there are other things, bump stocks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's sort of a given. But yeah, universal background checks, mm -hmm. that's just you know, it's kind of the right sense, thing. Kind of common sense, right? Yeah, right. it is common sense. What are your thoughts on arming teachers in public schools? Bad There's idea. A, a, a push for this in some districts We do districts not need now. more guns in schools. Well, it's a um, terrible idea. Do you have some alternative ideas to, uh, to help keep well, our schools I think, safer? Yeah. I mean, uh, I was on the school board for mm -hmm. 16 years mm -hmm. in an inner city. And, I mean, we had police in our schools, and it, it, it worked. We had a great relationship with the Covington Police Force. And, uh, you know, the, the so-called SROs, I think, mm -hmm. is what they're... Mm -hmm. Um, you know, now, uh, interestingly, though, I will say this, in, in Boone County, and you, and you and I were both uh, at the b board meeting where this was discussed, I talked with, um, and this was, I thought, a fascinating conversation, with their uh, student school board member uh -huh. that night, smart fellow, he's going to go to MIT, and he, uh, and I, I asked him what he thought about it, he said, well, he said, look, for us, he said, it works. I mean, we've got the money. Mm -hmm. Boone County is a rich school system, relatively speaking, and so we can afford this. Mm -hmm. And there had already been a deal worked out. The sheriff's office and, you know, they're going to have people for every school. But he said there are other school systems in the state, and he's 100 percent right about this, that don't have those right. funds. Right. And he was sort of saying, you know, I just don't know in those circumstances where they can't afford mm -hmm. to bring in law enforcement people if if they should be held to the same standard. And I thought that was, you know, that's the kind of question that, that has to be thought right. about and has to be um, taken seriously. Mm -hmm. So I think so, as a general rule, though, my, my principle would be bringing more guns into a school is a terrible mm -hmm. idea. So would you support funding those um, SROs yes. for all schools? Then? Yes, Okay. absolutely. <laughs> We've got an online question, okay. so we're going to ask that. Do you know if a bill has been passed or is being considered which limits who can be appointed to have a GAL gal in family court? Guardian ad litem. Mm -hmm. um, no. no. The short answer is no. I'm sorry. I do not know uh, whether such a bill has been introduced. I don't, if, I don't think I remember mm -hmm. hearing about such a bill passing, but, uh, you know, guardian ad litems are... Uh, I think in Kentucky, attorneys mm -hmm. who serve uh, the child's interests. Uh, and um, <clears throat> yeah, it's different in Ohio, and I tend to get them confused mm -hmm. at times, mm -hmm. but I didn't do family law. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's talk about health care and Medicaid. Um, we were one of the first states uh, that kind of embraced the ACA's um, expansion and, and all of those things, and now the governor wants to a cut back on the expansion and put on some work work requirements for Medicaid. What are your thoughts on all of these uh, things that are happening? Well, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> Let me preface my answer. This is something, uh, again, in my career in Ohio, uh, it's where I worked, but I um, got deeply, deeply involved in the efforts to adopt the Medicaid expansion over there and, and actually helped to lead a statewide coalition that worked very closely with uh, Governor Kasich and mm -hmm. his administration. Uh, people in uh, the Office of Health Transformation there, Greg Moody, John, John McCarthy is Medicaid uh, person, to get it adopted over there. And once it was adopted, 700,000 people got health care. Wow. Same deal here. Mm -hmm. Bashir did it a different way, but to his eternal credit, he did it. Mm -hmm. And so 400,000, I mean, counting for the difference in the state right, sizes right. and populations, People have health care. That is a good thing. <laughs> now, let me say something about Medicaid and, and work. You know, business people all the time are saying, don't lay requirements on us. Give us incentives. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't like requirements. So get rid of all that regulatory stuff, you know. And just create incentives for mm -hmm. us to do the right thing. Well, Medicaid is the greatest work incentive ever, or one of the greatest ones ever invented. People work because they can. <laughs> because... 
if they have health care, first of all, they're healthier. Right, right. They're a healthier parent. They're a healthier employee. Mm -hmm. They're they're a healthier citizen, and they're they're a healthier person. You know, mm -hmm. and and so they function better. And people want to work if it right. works. It, you know, again, it comes back to the equation of does does this work for you? So needing to put a work requirement, which uh, they're trying to do in Ohio as well, mm -hmm. by the way. And, but 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 that uh, Bevan has gotten passed is um, is terrible. I mean, it's just a wrong way to go. By his own paperwork that was filed with the waiver, a hundred thousand of those four hundred thousand people will lose coverage. Mm -hmm. Now, my friends in the legal aid community in Kentucky, <laughs> now I even helped them a little bit. Uh -huh. They sued, uh, and I was a little bit involved in that. That's good. Inter interviewed some plaintiffs. Potential plaintiffs. The um, uh, the um, uh, the lawsuit may or may not uh, succeed. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's challenging under federal law whether this whether the program meets the waiver requirements. Babin has said, and this is the real point, that if they succeed in getting his waiver knocked out, he'll just stop it for everybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to think, <laughs> what person would say we're going to take health care away from 400,000 people because my feelings got hurt? I mean, that is absurd. I mean, really. Uh, so I have very, very strong feelings about that and would, would do everything am doing everything mm -hmm. in my power, right. actually. My friends are. Right. Uh, they're, they're very good. And, mm -hmm. and so if there's a legal way to, to defeat this thing, That's they good. will do That's so. That's good to hear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, the, but it should be, it, it's wrong. It should mm -hmm. be done away with, and, and the, the expansion should be maintained. Mm -hmm. Everybody benefits. I mean, go down to the uh, rural counties and talk to their hospital right. people. The only way they stay, you know this. I know. From I know. You know, they, they would stay open right. otherwise. Absolutely. Right? Yep. Absolutely. So we need to keep it. Okay, so we're at the end of our time with our questions, and now if you want to just talk to our audience um, for a few minutes and um, tell them why they should vote for you on May 22nd. Well, again, thank you all for being here uh, with us tonight and for hanging in uh, for this discussion. Um, I hope that in this conversation we've had, I've given all of you uh, some insight into why I think I'm prepared to take this job on. Um, I've worked in legislatures for 36 years. I know something about the process. Um, I, you know, what's at stake here is to some degree what I think about these issues. And actually, I think if you compared what I think and what the other uh, person running for this position thinks, they're very similar. They're very similar. But the difference is, as I see it, what experience do you bring to the table that enables you not just to have the right idea or the right value or, or the right, right policy goal, but to have the capacity to be a part, a meaningful part of the process to get those things done. And, I, you know, I, it's a little awkward sitting here and using the word I so much and, and talking so much about oneself, but that is what this is about here. And I, I, I am trying to help voters understand why I think it's a prudent choice to vote for me. I have done these things. I have worked with work groups involving people like the Senate president and governors, for that matter, in, in their efforts to solve problems. I've had a lot of leadership positions over the years in these different endeavors. One of the reasons is because people typically find me reasonable, open, fair, and, and an honest broker. And so people, by and large, entrust people with leadership that they think they're going to get a fair shake from. Not that they think that I'm going to agree with them on everything. I don't. And they know I'm a person of very strong convictions, and I'm sure that's come across tonight. But the, at bottom, it's what skill sets do you have? What experiences do you have? What can you point to that, that you've done and been a part of that actually moves these good ideas into policy? I think I have those qualities. I think I have that, that experience. I think I have the skill sets, and, I, and I'm ready. You know, I couldn't do this while I was employed. First of all, I was legally prohibited from doing it, but I, I couldn't do this uh, before I, I left legal aid. But now I am ready to invest myself fully in this job, 
And I, I hope the voters will give me that opportunity. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Cal, and good luck. Um, so for everybody out there watching, we've got this recorded. It'll be on our YouTube channel or our um, Facebook page as well. And join us for our next episode next week. Thanks, everybody.